Welcome and thank you everyone for joining us today on this webinar titled Focus on Equity, Identify Disproportionate Impact in Excel. My name is Alyssa Nguyen and I will be passing the webinar off to Dr. Craig Hayward to get us started. Um, so we'll take a few minutes up top. This is our uh, um, sort of uh, ideal uh, time breakdown for each agenda item. So we'll uh, go through introductions in about five minutes. That includes the warm up and getting everybody in from the waiting room and getting started. And then I'll talk a little bit about the role of data in promoting equity in education um, and provide just a quick overview of the DI tool. Um, then Gio's gonna kind of get into the heart of the matter and talk about um, how to analyze your data uh, doing a guided walkthrough and you're all invited to follow along in the DI tool that you've downloaded and the data that you've downloaded ahead of time and prepped. And if you don't have that ready, that's fine. You can just follow along with the demo and do it later. Then we'll hear from Dr. Uh, Ray Ramirez from Fresno City College um, talking about um, his equity work and you know the value that he sees in something like the DI tool and how it fits with his initiatives. We'll have time for dialogue uh, amongst all of us and then we'll close out um, Alyssa and Barb um, will close us out and uh, kind of point us towards the future work with community of practice development and, and any announcements um, there. So that's the agenda. And this is us. Uh, go around and maybe we can each uh, introduce ourselves. Want to kick us off? We'll go top left to right. Gio, you can start. Marion. Yeah. My name is Gio Sosa. It's great to be with you. I work at Crafton Hills College. I oversee the Office of Institutional Effectiveness. Hello, everybody. My name is Ray Ramirez. I am the Director of Student Equity and Success at Fresno City College. I'm very thrilled and honored to be here with everyone today. I'm looking forward to this webinar. Hi everyone, Alyssa Nguyen, um, Director of Research and Evaluation for the RP Group. And good afternoon everybody, Craig Hayward, I'm the Dean of Institutional Effectiveness at Bakersfield College. And I'm Barbara Lazon, I'm a specialist in the Educational Services and Support Division at the Chancellor's Office. I'm thrilled to be here and very excited to um, be here as they share this exciting tool with you. Um, I got a preview of it and it's a really great tool to put in our toolbox as we work to chip away the equity gaps. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Barb. So I'm gonna start us off by talking briefly about the role of sort of numbers, quantitative research and statistics and equity work. And basically break it down into two ways that statistics have been used with racial data. Um, and um, basically they've been used badly is one of the ways. Um, uh, as uh, there's a famous saying that there are three types of lies in the world, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And uh, while, you know, as somebody who is a practitioner of statistics, I, um, I both appreciate and resent that uh, remark. Uh, I don't think that statistics are really that different from, say, words, right? So statistics can be used to tell the truth. Statistics can also be used to mislead and misdirect much as words can. So it really has a lot to do with sort of your intentions and how, what your, what your implicit biases are, how you intend to use that data, are you intending to uncover truth and, and advance uh, the cause of equity or um, in this, uh, as, as is shown in this um, historical reference uh, that uh, Ibram X. Kendi uh, brought up in a recent article in the Atlantic, um, he was. This statistics can be used entirely in the opposite way um, to uh, reinforce prejudices and stereotypes and, and create um, a, an anti um, equity, um, anti justice uh, narrative. And this book is not just some random book. This 1896 book by Frederick Hoffman called Race Traits. It's actually all of that considered to be a, um, a, a, a very important book in the, in the history of Are you ready, of, so, um, 
So the tables, it's basically a book of tables of statistics and it, it cites data on crime rates, infection rates, death rates, incarceration rates. So really, I think it, um, Ibram Kendi was bringing this up very relevant to our context today. As we look at the Black Lives Matter movement, we look at movies like 13th and um, in, you know the, the equity around disproportionate um, incarceration in this country and being one of the most incarcerated countries in the world. Um, however, it's possible to take data like this and draw a completely um, kind of anti-liberatory um, uh, perspective and in fact frame this data as justification uh, of black people as uh, dangerous, diseased, and dying people uh, in a way to normalize black suffering and death and justify slavery as having been preferable um, to, to freedom. And so even though that book was written in 1896, in many ways we live with the legacy of those types of um, rationalizations of uh, position coming out of the, the legacy of slavery in this country. Uh, other, so the, there is, in other words, those of us who are statisticians and work with statistics and data may feel that that's a, you know, a very transparent and open way to be, but it's also possible, um, certainly, um, to use these data incorrectly and to kind of model and reify um, stereotypes uh, and, and negative um, prejudices that people have. And that's part of why you know, we have some additional resources listed here. Uh, the critical race theory perspective sometimes has a bit of a, um, you know, um, conflicted relationship with quantitative um, uh, data um, because it's often used to sort of justify the status quo. And um, so how do we use then turning from the recognition that it is possible to use data um, improperly, that data can be um, problematic and it can reify um, uh, prejudices and stereotypes, how do we use statistics well? So as I mentioned before, your underlying intention is important. We're aiming at uncovering the truth. We're, we need to be sensitive to other truths and perspectives. Um, so this can involve um, appreciating outliers, um, decentering your perspective so that it's not always the, the norm or the average that is the the valued perspective, but uh, there's a variety of possible perspectives. It's important to, context to uh, contextualize your data in a historical context and also complement, very importantly, complement your quantitative data with qualitative inquiry. So focus groups, and we'll get into this some more, I think, when, when uh, Dr. Ramirez talks later, I think we'll have some really great examples. Um, so all in all, I'm saying this so that we, we're not going to spend that much more time on this because we, this is a, um, we're going to look at the DI tool, we're going to look at the disproportionate impact methods, but it's a way to just kind of preface this work and say we understand that the quantitative data may not be perfect in every regard, but nonetheless it is, it is very important. And as a bottom line, it's really important that we're able to kind of consistently look at whether we are closing gaps in, in student outcomes over time. So we need to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of our actions. So there are a lot of good ideas about how we can move forward and close gaps. And um, it's important that we, you know, kind of we want to back those um, activities and those plans that really work. So a note on the nomenclature here, the, um, the, we've got, you know, different ways of referring to gaps. There's the achievement gap, the equity gap, the opportunity gap. And they kind of have their different pros and cons. You may hear people use different um, versions of those. Um, I kind of settle like equity gap is the one that you may hear me use. But if you prefer one of these other versions, that's fine. It's no, no judgment on, on that. I think we're all trying to get to a place um, where these gaps, however you um, refer to them, uh, are no longer, no longer with us. And we have a place of, of equity for all. So here's a quick view, quick run through of the, of the tool. Uh, uh, version 3.1, uh, we're now up to version 3.2 as we made a few tweaks in, in getting ready for the webinar. So basically when you open up the tool, you're gonna see that you have seven tabs along the bottom. 
And the first tab is this one, the uh, introduction, just gives kind of a basic overview to the tool. Uh, the second tab is the menu. And here you have four options on the menu. And if you click on one of these, basically just takes you to that tab that corresponds to that. So there's two calculators, one where you don't have success rates, uh, but you do have the counts of students who are successful and the counts of students in the overall group. And then one where you have success rates and then also counts of the size of the students in the, in the groups. Uh, then a couple of sample views so you can see what each of those uh, calculators should look like. The uh, success rate not available, sometimes we call this the counts method. Uh, and we were working on this with Brittany. Uh, so some of you came in early, saw Brittany filling in the cohort names uh, were the ethnicity groups. The cohort count was the total size and total number of students in those groups. And then the outcome count was the, the third row uh, in yellow there, um, the number of students who were successful from each of those groups. And then the rest of it fills in automatically for you. Um, so that's kind of the beauty of the tool. If you're able to provide that information, here, if you don't have the outcome count, but you do have the success rate, as often is the case from some dashboards, uh, you can put in the success rate. If you know the total number of students that that represents, then this uh, calculator, this tool will also work for you. And then we have some examples where you can see um, this display, which I, you know, as we come up on July 4th, I think is very patriotic looking kind of looks like an American flag there and with the color scheme. But the, the pink and the rows of the um, cells are showing where the disproportionate impact is for the different um, methodologies. And there are three different methodologies represented here, two of which are currently in use um, by the Chancellor's Office, which is the percentage point gap um, index, or it's been revised now as the PPG minus one and the PI index. But we also include the 80% index just as, as a reference. Um, it's, um, it's valuable to cross-reference across these different methodologies. And then this is the example of the success rate method where we filled in the two um, yellow columns in it and it calculated for us. Now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Geo and you're, he's gonna walk us through um, an example of the data. Feel free to fire up your own uh, DI tool. Right. So hopefully you see that there. So you should, I hope you're able to see my screen here. I have, I've split my screen so that you have, or that I have the, the data we're gonna be working with on the left, on the right, the calculators themselves or, or, or the file that we're gonna be used to. To, to generate those DI uh, values. So this assumes, of course, that you've already gathered or exported the data from LaunchBoard. Uh, if you haven't already, I included a link or I included a file that walks you through all the steps that you would need to gather that information. I would add, of course, that you can use a calculator or, or rather the, the use of the calculator is not limited to just launch or, or data mark for that matter. If you have counts of information, you have data for your students that you gather just internally from your college, you can most certainly use that very same information to calculate DI using all three methods using this calculator. So don't feel like you're limited to just publicly available data or data just from launch board or from data mark. But we picked launch board because of course we all have access to it and it's something, a tool that really lends itself to the use of the DI calculators. So with that said, the first step you want to do, and this goes back to something that Craig shared earlier, is to identify which specific calculator you want to use. You have the two options as Craig described earlier. You have one where the success rates are not available or the counts method and you have the other where in fact you do have the success rates but may not have the outcome counts. We're gonna go with the first one. Technically, our, our export from launch board has both the cohort and outcome counts and also has a percentages. So technically, we could work with either calculator. I think for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna go with that very first one, success rates not available. So I'm gonna select that option. Doing so, of course, takes me to the calculator as you see there on the right. And as Craig noted, all, all that's required of you is to enter information into those columns shaded in yellow. So everything else 
is automatically populated once you enter the data into those two columns shaded in yellow. So then let's go back for a moment to our left side in our launch board export. First thing we want to do is maybe copy over the groups in question. So I'm going to do that and do one column at a time. So you can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Paste the values. And then I'm going to bring in information for the cohort counts. Note that in this case, the columns are not lining up. So with what's denoted in the launch board export as the denominator data reflects a cohort count data as per the, the calculator itself. So I'm going to bring that over, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then lastly, the students data, which as per the calculator nomenclature would refer to the outcome count. So of course, the cohort count in the calculator reflects the entire sample or entire population of students that you're working with, and the outcome count reflects among those in the cohort count that achieved the outcome in question, in this case, having earned 12 plus units in that first semester as per the launch board definition. So once you have the data now copied over to the calculator, we're done with the launch board export. So I'm gonna increase the size of the screen here. I, I hope, and I'm gonna look to Craig to help me. Should I zoom in a little bit more, Craig, for, for, for greater clarity, or do you think that maybe I'll zoom just a little bit so people can see? It, yeah, I, I can read it okay, okay on my laptop screen. Okay, perfect. So I'll, I'll go from there. So as I said earlier and Craig shared earlier, once you have the information in yellow in place, everything populates for you. Of course, what's a particular, likely a particular interest for you is the information related to the three uh, DI methods, the percentage point gap method, the PI method, and the 80% rule of the 80% index. I'll note as Craig noted or reaffirm what Craig shared, that the percentage point gap method has been tweaked to reflect the new PPG minus one methodology. So you don't see the, the methodology reflected here, at least at the very top of the sheet. So for those of you wondering, those calculations take place at the very bottom of the file. We kept it at the bottom just to keep the look and feel at least of the actual calculated clean, but know that those calculations are being done based upon those secondary calculations at the bottom of that sheet. And so what we're looking for here in examining the PPG values, the PI index values, and the 80% rule values, specifically are those values that are shaded in pink. It's those values that are shaded in pink that denote instances of DI as defined by each of those methods. The first thing you can, you'll can you note here is the Hispanic population, as per the calculator, has been identified as being disproportionately impacted, at least on the basis of the PPG method. But notice, not so on the basis of the PI index that has a cutoff of equal to or less than 0.8. So not, not defined as DI as per the PI index, but defined as PI or as DI per the 80% rule and a percentage point gap index, which underscores, I think, a broader point in that when you're looking at your data, certainly the two methods that are approved by the Chancellor's Office are the ones you want to prioritize, the PPG method and the, the proportionality of the PI index. But again, I would compare not just those two, but also look at the 80% rule. And at this point, if I would continue to look at maybe additional outcome data to see if there's consistency for the Hispanic population. It's possible that there's DI for 12 plus units. You can also look to see if there's consistency across outcomes to further um, increase your confidence that, that the Hispanic population is one, one that certainly is disproportionately impacted at your college. So you can look at things like those earning six plus units or those persisting from one semester to the next to reaffirm the consistency of this outcome. Uh, let's see, let's have another quick, oh, one other point that I'll note too. The, and this gets maybe slightly into the weeds, but I think it is an important point to make. The, the PPG method and the MOE, the margin of error that you see reflected in column J, they are very sensitive to sample size. They're very sensitive specifically to the number of records you have here under your cohort count. Records that, that exceed 500 or 800 are ones that increase quite significantly the chances of you getting a significant PPG value. 
So if you have a very large cohort, 800 plus, and we do here, in fact, with Hispanic population, we have 2,000 students in this group, the likelihood of you getting a significant or shaded PPG value is higher than if that cohort count was lower. So in the case of the unknown group here, where you have only 46, the likelihood of you finding a shaded cell for that group is much, much lower, largely by virtue of the fact that that's a small group to begin with. It gets into st st statistical theory, I, I think that goes beyond the scope of our session, but I think it's a point to to bear in mind when you're looking at your findings and all the more reason why you want to look at not just PPG but also the PI index to further gather that clarity regarding which groups are being impacted. Um, let's see, one other point I'll make is with respect to the full equity number. So the three DI methods will tell you whether DI is present, where the disproportionate impact is present. The equity numbers are based upon the PPG, or the percentage point gap method approach, and they give you a sense for the number of students that would have to achieve that outcome, in this case having earned 12 plus units, in order for the difference to be eliminated, in order for the gap to be eliminated in order for the disproportionate impact to be eliminated. And I think it's rather helpful because it gives you more of a practical sense for how many students we're talking about. So in the case of Hispanic students, that number is 90. So you would need an additional 90 students earning that 12 plus unit mark among the 2033 in order for that disproportionate impact to be eliminated or that gap completely to be eliminated. Trying to think. Any other notes, Craig, you think are worth worth adding here? I, I would say, too, if you are uh, new to this, I highly recommend you look at the sample views. So you get a sense for what, what it is you'll likely get before you start playing with, with the columns. And, and I found just from experience that when people look at this, especially if you're newer to data, to data literacy, when you look at something like this and you see just a bunch of zeros and blank columns, you may feel a little unsure of how to proceed. But remember that as long as you complete those two columns shaded in yellow, everything else will populate for itself and it'll look something akin to what you see in those sample views. The only exception would be for the cohort names on the far right or far left. This is something that you would have to manually key in. They're not, they're not required for you to compute all the metrics, all of the disproportionate impact methods, but I would, I would recommend strongly that you enter this information more for interpretation's sake, so you know which specific groups we're talking about when you start looking at the, the pink or the red shaded areas. So the 80% okay. 80, 80 rule is in reference to the, well, you, can, you can actually decide what the appropriate reference group is, Vita, um, but in general, it, this will look at the highest, the group with the highest performance and that, um, but in some cases, uh, you, you know, it may make sense to use a different group um, for some of the reasons that Gio was just discussing in terms of, um, you know, sample size or, uh, you know, often um, white students are used as a reference group because that's, there's a historical um, kind of validity to using whites as a reference group. Um, so, uh, yeah, and the, the DI tool does use the, the group with the highest performance as the reference group for the 80% rule. Um, so, Gio, you asked about uh, whether there were any other points. I, I think one of the points to underscore uh, with this tool is really just the flexibility of this tool. Um, I've been uh, interacting with folks in the chat, and we're going to have some time for dialogue uh, in just a bit. So I look forward to kind of, you know, hearing some more from all of you, and, and you can have a chance to kind of weigh in and, and dialogue. But... Um, one of the things that we're talking about is data sources and, you know, SEA data, student success metrics data. But this uh, tool can be used with any data. It can be used with, you know, the data for one program on program review. Um, it, it can be used uh, for local data that's more updated than what's available in statewide dashboards. Um, and I think it can be really helpful for your, your equity work um, in terms of its ability to sort of flexibly support different um, BI analyses that you might want to engage in 
um, in addition to and kind of supporting the overall institutional DI that you get from the from SEA and Mission for Success data that's delivered um, at the state level and at the college level. Thanks. And that's a great point to, to just reiterate. This is very flexible. All right, I think, um, Gio, are we ready to wrap up the demo? I, I think so, unless there are questions. I haven't been following the chat, Craig. The, there are quite a few questions. I think they're more, I, it sounds like uh, uh, Minerva was asking, do you mean degree or certificate completion? Um, Jessica would like a full description of methodology. Someone has provided some links um, to the Chancellor's office document describing the three methods. And um, We'll look at, there is a document out there, the 2017 document, that's now a little bit out of date as far as how the PPG is calculated. Right. And I was just reflecting on whether there exists one document that is current that actually pulls together all of the, there's the, the work to you know, that, that we did as yeah. part of the IETI and your... Yes. And I, I'm happy to share, that's a great point, Craig. I'm happy to share that, that document. Yeah, I'm happy to share that, that link. The only piece that's missing from that document, because it was published in 2018, is the, the the adjustments that were made just in the last year with the goal setting effort. So it's not it's not going to make reference to the PPG minus one item and maybe a couple of other pieces. Um, but I would say maybe that's something. Maybe that's something. Obviously, we need to talk about it offline. So but I think yeah, I'm for, for now. It might be the most current document. Mm -hmm. for folks to reference in learning more about the more of the nuance. I, I think we've covered things rather comprehensively in our session, but there is some nuance that we're, we're skipping over. And I think that document gets much more into that nuance if, if you're inclined. And, and I would say too, that the document wasn't written specifically for researchers. The, the audience in mind is general. So if you, if you don't have the data or the research background, we, we, we went to great pains to in incorporate real world examples using actual college data and to walk, to walk the reader through each of the steps associated with generating the DI information and then thinking critically about what it means. So I'll go ahead and so share that. that that's brilliant. Um, so Gio, maybe you can stop sharing and we'll go oh, back. Yes. Well, I'll work with uh, the next segment with Ray and, um, and then you'll put, you'll just put the uh, document available yes. for sharing in the chat and everybody can download it right now. Um, but I'll maybe make it available as a standalone PDF as well. Um, so uh, can everybody still hear me? Yeah, okay, I just got a message that Zoom quit unexpectedly. So I'm, I'm not sure why it's saying that. I'm going to ignore it. Um, hopefully I don't disappear um, all of a sudden. Uh, wanted to um, have some time to talk with uh, Dr. Ramirez now as uh, a voice from the, the campus level work on equity. Um, Ray, are you, are you still with us? Hi, Craig. Yes, I'm still here. All right. Well, welcome. Um, can you just tell us what your role is at Fresno City College and, and your title? Absolutely. So um, I am the director of student equity and success. Um, at Fresno City College. Um, so part of my responsibilities includes um, oversight of the development and implementation of our student equity plan and AB 18 or 9 efforts. Um, and uh, naturally, uh, for many years now, as an official adoptee of our Institutional Research and Effectiveness Office, uh, I work very intimately with our research team. Right. I think you said that you were, uh, they, they'd adopted you un unofficially at that is that is correct. Yes, our, uh, ever since our previous director of the office um, kind of adopted me, um, it really hasn't stopped, and, and the team has uh, uh, maintained that adoption. <laughs> you're you're an honorary member of the research squad there. So, when what do you think uh, as an equity um, leader and someone uh, who's interested in data and institutional effectiveness, when you see the DI, when or when you saw the DI tool? Um, what were your thoughts in terms of its possible uses or, or did you find it to be, um, you know, intriguing or, or what kind of potential might it have? Sure. No, great, great question. Um, 
Personally, I, I think it is a, it's a useful tool. I, I find it pragmatic, um, though having been, a, been a, um, exposed to a previous version um, that Geo brought to the RP group, RP groups leading from the middle, um, we got to experience um, what the tool looks like in practice. So kind of had you know, a, a pre-existing um, understanding of how they use the tool. So um, certainly this has been helpful as well. Um, and in terms of like it being pragmatic in a similar way, you know, I can really see this tool being incorporated into one of our, our student equity plan activities, um, which is called the Interdisciplinary Faculty Equity Lab, Equity-Minded Tools for Reflective Teaching Practice. And one of the components of this um, Interdisciplinary Faculty Equity Lab, AKA IPL, we call it IPL, it's a lot easier to say, um, is uh, looking at, um, at data, but first um, understanding how to look at data to, to uncover um, equity gaps, um, and specifically with this IPL um, cohort of faculty members, uh, racial equity gaps. Um, and currently, um, the faculty can look at their own course data in comparison to departmental data and across the discipline. Um, I can see this tool being incorporated into IPL to look at um, some of those outcome disparities and learn how to calculate those disparities based on the three methodologies um, and compare the three against each other on a broader level, right? And so starting with the college perhaps as a whole and then breaking it down by what we call now our RAM pathways or previously divisions. And so I can see that being very useful and germane to the conversations that the faculty are going to have about their own um, racial equity data in their courses juxtapose the larger, broader um, data um, pulled and calculated from this pool. So I, I've heard you talk about the uh, Interdisciplinary Faculty Equity Lab before, and it just sounds fascinating. And I know that you put uh, a fair, and can we pronounce that Eiffel for short, like Eiffel Tower? That is maybe? correct, everyone okay. says Eiffel Tower, yes. <laughs> Eiffel. Um, and uh, that, that sounds like a, um, you put a lot of work and thought into developing that. Can you explain to us maybe just a little bit more uh, about how Eiffel works and where where that came from? Most definitely, I'd be glad to. Um, and, and really, I cannot take um, all, in fact, or any, any credit. Um, certainly, there has been a, a team that has uh, led to the creation of Eiffel, um, and even our partners um, from the USC Center for Urban Education. Um, you know, Fresno City College recently completed a two-year partnership with the Center for Urban Education, also known as Q, um, in 2019. And essentially, our Q partners helped us develop a working sense of where we are with regard to racial equity and how we can advance our equity work going forward. Ultimately, the Interdisciplinary Faculty Equity Lab grew out of this work in partnership with Q. And so that's kind of the, um, the impetus for the creation of IPOL. Um, it's a um, semester-long um, series, uh, and it's a cohort model of interdisciplinary faculty who engage in um, seven three-hour sessions. Um, and on top of those three-hour sessions, there's assigned um, reading, um, bona fide assignments, and activities. And we have a lead faculty member who um, was very much involved with our, our work with Q over the course of two years and has um, really been engaged and exposed to um, um, a litany of, of trainings with you and other uh, racially equity focused organizations. So um, my colleague, Dr. Maria Valentino, she very much treats IPOL, this cohort, like um, a graduate course. And based on observation and coming into the first session, the faculty are very receptive to this environment and this idea of using critical learning and inquiry to transform teaching um, so it's been been very um, very exciting for the college. Um, yeah, that sounds exciting. Um, are, are you can, are you using mixed methods at all as part of that work? Are you looking at quantitative and qualitative data together? Absolutely, yeah. So as part of our work with IPO, um and also with our institutional research and effectiveness committee, um, we certainly use mixed methods to inform our equity efforts at the college. You know. Most of the statistical tests analysis that we run, um, you know, they, they tell what but not necessarily why, right? And so what we do is we use our qualitative um, forms of inquiry, primarily through focus groups um, with a few select one-to-one -one interviews to really give voice to those quantitative data. Um, because, right, those, those analyses of the quantitative data 
um, they're, they're limited, right? Like most data that we work with. And so one way to enhance our understanding really of the student experience as it relates to those quantitative data, it's been very helpful for us to pull some of the quotes and some of the themes that have emerged throughout the focus groups and some of the interviews. Um, in a similar way, we have uh, the survey that we have uh, conducted, right? The, the several surveys we've administered on campus, um, certainly some of those have open-ended questions and we've also used those open-ended questions and um, we have identified themes and different um, um, similarities that percolate to the top um, to really inform those uh, quantitative numbers. So um, how do you interpret, do you have contextual frameworks? I've, I've heard you refer to something called the transformative paradigm. Yes. So does this, you, like you're saying, you can use the DI tool to sort of do a first pass high level, uh, and it might tell you that disproportionate impact exists, but it doesn't really tell you anything about why it exists or how to correct it, right? So it's, it's right. really just opening the conversation. So what? what how do those those things, the contextual frameworks and the transformative paradigm, how do they help us move forward with the work? Oh, well, thank you, Craig. Um, th that's a great question. Um, a very important question for us, for all of us really to, to critically think about, right? Um, because, you know, this disproportionate impact tool, um, unless we couple it with um, framing and um, paradigms that better lend themselves to understanding the experience of students, then it only becomes that, right? A disproportionate impact tool. So I think it's a great question. And one thing that we've done um, with our institutional research and effectiveness committee, and something really that uh, me and my research colleagues from Fresno City College, a little shout out, I, I think most if not all are on the call. <laughs> one thing we've been trying to influence campus wide is to incorporate what is called the transformative paradigm um, and essentially, the transformative paradigm is rooted in the social justice branch of research um, and includes critical theorists, uh, participatory action researchers, Marxist, feminists, racially minoritized peoples, um, persons with disabilities, among others. And so um, this has been useful and really more specifically, uh, the, trans uh, the transformative paradigm um, centers the experience of marginalized communities, including analysis of power differentials that have led to the marginalization and links research findings to act, action intended to mitigate disparities. So, you know, the, the author or the creator, if you will, of this transformative paradigm, this, this branch of, of research to inform research rather, Donna Mertens, um, it, it's been very useful in our conversations um, in a pragmatic way, right? Because every person has their own dispositions, their own um, belief systems, and everyone has a different way of making sense of the world around them, right? And certainly that applies to data analyses. So what we've been able to do with this transformative paradigm is as a committee and outside of that institutional research and effectiveness committee, we've agreed to use that transformative paradigm as a tool to better understand the data that we look like, that we look at um, both quantitative and qualitative or mixed methods. So. Um, it's been very helpful in the conversations because sometimes uh, when you're looking at data uh, and you're talking about data and you're trying to make it discussable and understandable, we can really get in the weeds or we can just get really off track, right? And what this transformative paradigm has been helpful in is kind of grounding people back like, hey, we have this framework and we kind of have deviated from, you know, the intent of what we wanted to use the transformative paradigm for. So let's be reminded to kind of come back and, and use this uh, to inform the conversation. So it's definitely been helpful in that regard. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ramirez, for sharing that perspective with us. Uh, we're going to move on and kind of open up the dialogue now to include everybody. There's been some great comments coming in in the chat um, from, uh, from before and while you were talking. And this is going to be our opportunity. Yes, yes. Uh, use your reactions button. A little round of applause, uh, I think, is in order for Dr. Ramirez. Thanks, Amber. Um, and uh, so... Let's, I, I've got some different uh, notes that I've taken as, uh, on uh, questions that came up, and Alyssa and Gio and Barb, uh, you may have uh, focused in on others that you want to respond to, so I'm gonna, I'll gonna i step back for a minute, get my notes together, and, and let, let you uh, lead the way in getting the dialogue going. And feel free to you know, add your, your thoughts to the chat. Um,
So maybe to get us started, there were some suggestions about improvements to the tool. So Yosef asked if there was another perhaps um, label that can be used to describe the outcomes that end users can use. So instead of using success um, rates, perhaps using another label so that people don't confuse core success rates with when we talk about outcomes success. Right, oh, that's great. So maybe something like outcome rate, I mean, that aligns more directly to the preceding column. That's great, thank you. I want I wanted to just give a shout out to Victoria for um, sharing a uh, a document um, earlier in the webinar that I thought was really helpful. Uh, the Moynihan report in the 1960s, which is kind of known for pathologizing using data to pathologize African American um, Black families in in the United States. So um, I think that if if you're if you're looking for evidence that this is something that has a legacy, you you, you can really, uh, you can find it. Um, and thank you for sharing that, Victoria, kind of a more contemporary example um, from the 60s. Uh, another point that was brought up was the point of omission um, of categories. So if we're looking at disproportionate impact and, you know, we're legislated to work with equity in a, in a particular format, um, that can be restrictive somewhat. So if you're in an area where you have um, uh, racial or eth ethnic groups that are not represented in the, the categories that are called out in the state legislation, this tool allows you to sort of explore DI using the official methodology for different groups if you have data on those groups. Of course, you have to be able to collect the data on those groups to get this, this quantitative analysis. But it's certainly true um, that omission or sort of elision of different groups, we often see this um, in conversations around the kind of the pan-ethnic use of Asian American represent um, all peoples of Asian descent, and that in fact that that kind of elides and covers up a, a great deal of variability amongst uh, peoples of Asian descent. So um, that would be an example where you could use this tool to break out all of, all of the different Asian subpopulation that you have and look at them with, with much more granular detail. So um, really good point there. We're not a monolith. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Um, any other, I don't, any other thought, we got new um, voices coming up in the, and you can unmute yourself, I think. We, this is a, a pretty orderly group, so if you wanna chime in, I think we've got some time here, got a few minutes. If you've got something you're dying to say. How have others contextualized their um, quantitative DI findings? So Ray shared um, the use of focus groups as a way to contextualize and color what we're seeing through numbers and figures. Um, what other strategies have others used to help them triangulate and understand why the outcomes you are seeing? One, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just jump in and, and ask kind of a, a refinement. It, one of the things that we've been talking a lot is kind of in, about a lot is instructor effects and disaggregating um, uh, kind of racial, ethnic groups by instructor and looking at how those patterns of DI may vary from instructor to instructor and kind of there's a, there seems to be a kind of a rich opportunity for exploration of you know what, why some faculty may be experiencing DI outcomes and other faculty not. What what are the pedagogical um, uh, and sort of uh, you know other potential issues that might lead to uh, those differences? And there are some methodologies that have been proposed around that. I don't. Is anyone um, working with that? Well, I've seen in Titus's Amber at. 
San Jose Evergreen Community College District. And I actually, UCLA um, had done some really great stuff by looking at STEM and their grading policies being sort of grading on a curve and the negative impact that has on students of color versus other types of grading where you just give students the grade they earn. Um, and so those are potentials, I would imagine, at, at our institutions, if we look at certain disciplines that have uh, certain grading or expectations about student work and what is, um, what is good performance. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Ken Songko. I'm Director of Student Equity and Success at Mission College. And um, Dr. Ramirez, I'm very delighted to hear you know, what you're doing in terms of grounding the data conversation via transformative pedagogy. I'm curious to know, um, if you don't mind sharing with the group, what are some conversations that have come out um, via using and leveraging the expertise of interdisciplinary faculty, like in terms of, say, addressing Latinx students, or could you share with us an example using the data and, um, and walk us through that process if, if that's possible? Sure, absolutely. Um, I don't know if, if time permits and, and if it's um, suitable, Craig, perhaps we can uh, briefly display that one slide on the um, participant learning outcomes of IFL. Um, Ken, thank you for your question. Um, I think that the participant learning outcomes might help um, answer your question. Um, and what I can tell you in a nutshell, um, while Craig is going to display the um, slide, is one of the main um, purposes of IFL is to normalize um, racial equity with faculty. And so in essence, to make race discussable um, for the purpose of making racial equity um, achievable. And so um, those data and utilizing various um, paradigms, because really the transformative paradigm is like a cocktail of theoretical like foundations and underpinnings that inform what I call critical research, right? Um, and so if you look at the participant learning outcomes here, Ken, and the rest of the colleagues on the call, um, you can see that um, really the design of this interdisciplinary faculty equity lab is to impact practice and impact what happens inside and outside of the classroom with regard to faculty student interactions and engagement. Um, Ken, I hope that helps answer your question a little bit. Um, I do not attend all the IFL sessions with the faculty. I attend the first session and I do a presentation on some kind of global data, uh, statewide, uh, starting nationwide, statewide, and then I kind of narrow it more focused to Fresno and some of the, the outcome disparities that play communities of colors, not just in education, but across various um, sectors and, and industries. So, um, but I have heard some great reviews and speaking to those faculty. Um, in fact, we have several faculty who want to start teaching the next cohorts of, of IFL and really that's what it's designed for is to be a train the trainer program so it appears to be working in that regard. Thank you. Thanks Ken and we're um, just about ready to wrap up here. Um, were there any other um, kind of final thoughts as we head into the the wrap up? Any last questions? I know that there's there's uh, been some work um, at Butte College on um, faculty um, led groups to investigate um, disaggregated student success outcomes um, by racial ethnic groups. Um, kind of predicated on some work that that James Gray did at Aurora College in Colorado, and James Gray. I, came and I don't know if he's still at the Center for Urban Equity, but he was there for a year visiting as a visiting scholar. Um, and it sounds like some of that work is maybe represented or landing in the uh, interdisciplinary faculty equity lab in terms of it. I think the importance of it being a faculty led conversation around how equity shows up and how um, the classroom can be a racialized or is a racialized space. And, and being willing to engage with the data and the work around creating and enacting equity. So we, I think we have some examples in the, in the states. We have Fresno, there's Butte, and uh, I think that these are some really wonderful ideas that we can all, you know, learn, look at and learn from. And I look forward to hearing more about what other, other folks are, are doing in this area. 
Oh, someone says James Grace. He's still at. He's still with Q. All right. So um, thanks for the dialogue, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Uh, we're going to give you a homework assignment uh, as a, a show of our esteem for you. We don't want to let you go. So um, let's keep it. Let's kind of keep it rolling. Let's use the Vision Resource Center as a place where we can have a permanent um, place to record our thoughts and share documents and ideas. Uh, they've created a thread for us under the, um, the equity uh, community of practice on the Vision Resource Center. So um, here's, here's the thread and just go, your assignment is, is to you know, find, the, find the VRC, log in, it, you know, many of you probably already have logged in and let's share your comments on this webinar, your thoughts, um, where you'd like to see it go, improvements to the DI tool, you know, what have you. Um, so how do you get there? Here's a, a short link. Um, you can just Google it, of course, but if you want, there's a, a link that's pretty easy to use. The, uh, uh, just type that in. The capitalization does matter. So it's BRC dash, uh, BRC being all uppercase and then dash login, all lowercase. Uh, and that's a bit.ly link. And you just come in and you just, you know, when you land, you hit the connect button and then click on under connect. There'll be a drop down menu, click on all communities and go to CCC equity. And that's where you'll find um, our thread. It's right at the top right now because it's it was just posted recently. So let's go blow that up. Um, log in there and, and let them know that we, we are engaged. Uh, so make your voice heard, be present on the equity and or research list serves, bring, keep that equity perspective going. Um, it, it's wonderful to, to hear uh, about all the good work that our people people are doing. We want to hear now that you have the DI tool, you've seen how to use it, play with it a little bit, explore how you might use it with your local data. Um, you know, we're thinking, you know, at Bakersfield College, we're using it with data coaches. We're training data coaches how to use it for meta major areas. We're looking at DI in our program review data. Um, and there, I think there are challenges that you encounter when you when you get down to these more granular levels. Um, but I think that's also where the action is. And that's where the promise is to actually um, close these gaps in meaningful ways. So, uh, you know, get out there, get logged in, share your comments, do some good work. We'd love to hear about it. Um, and that's kind of uh, our, our bit for today. If you want to follow up with any of us, here's our contact information. Uh, Ray and I are all over Twitter. Uh, so if you'd like to tweet, you can find us there. There's our Twitter handle. Uh, there's everybody's emails if you'd like to reach out and connect. And um, Alyssa, Barb, do we have any um, kind of, uh, summary or closing comments, next steps that you'd like to, to um, add? Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining and note that I'm hoping we can continue this type of conversation with using data to to look more at instruction and even um, within student services supports as, as Minerva mentioned in the chat uh, at the Pathways to Equity Conference, which is apparently still on for the fall. It's just gonna be online. So that's at the end of September. Um, I'll post some information about it to the Vision Resource Center in case you haven't seen anything about it yet, but I wanna continue this discussion with this community. Wonderful, thank you so much, Barb. Thank you everybody for coming today. Have a great day and, and a good 4th uh, of July, good week. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.